I'm Anthony Scaramucci, and welcome to Open Book, where I talk with some of the most interesting and brilliant minds in our world today. So joining us now, literally my favorite author, uh, living author, I should say, um, you know, there's a few like uh, Plato that may be up there too, but Ken Follett is an internationally best-selling author of 37 books, quite frankly, one of the most successful authors of all time. This book, perhaps his finest, at least it's up there, The Armor of Light. I got I to gotta tell you, Ken, it was a, a brilliant read. Uh, I'm glad that we delayed our podcast so I could finish the book, by the way, because I uh, I enjoyed reading I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to finish it by the time you and I got together. Of course, I won't spoil the ending because I want all of our viewers and listeners to go out and buy the book. Uh, it's brilliant. <laughs> and as I mentioned last time, I got introduced to Mr. Follett at the age of 14 in 1978, where my English professor gave me the eye of the needle and said that I have to read this book. And of course, since then, I've read, I think, every one of your books, sir. So it's an honor to have you back on. Um, New York Times bestseller, uh, hit number one in many countries around the world. I was in my grandparents' uh, um, country, Italy, uh, last week. There were large signs up for the book in its Italian translation, which I know is very popular there as well. Um, sir, tell us about this book. Tell us where all of this comes from. Uh, you know, the, 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 the ancient Native Americans call it indigo, where something is guiding you in life that allows you to express art in this way. Tell us, tell us how you manifested this book. Uh, I thought of the Industrial Revolution it's a time of great conflict, and of course, conflict is what drives a novel. There's, if there's no conflict, there's really no novel. Uh, and I thought about the fact that uh, a technical revolution, such as happened in the late 18th century, uh, creates winners and losers. It, it puts some people out of work. And other people get opportunities and get better jobs and get paid more money. And that kind of balance uh, is, uh, for me, is good in a novel because you don't always want um, uh, you don't always want the novel to be a straightforward battle between good and evil. It's kind of better if there's if there's some good and some wrong on both sides. Yes, no question. And, uh, the industrial revolution struck me that way which was promising. And then I, I realized that the period I was looking at really coincided with the, the terrible European war that's called the Napoleonic Wars. And Britain was at war with France for 23 years. And that war made the trials of people in the Industrial Revolution much worse because it exacerbated uh, all the problems. So uh, there were war taxes, which created inflation. Uh, there was uh, inflation, particularly in food prices. The, the price of a four-pound loaf of bread, which was the staple for many decades, uh, doubled. And uh, uh, there was also the issue of people being forced to join the army when they didn't want to. So it's a it's a it's a it's a regular. Crisis caused by technical crisis caused by technical uh, um, uh, uh, changes, and it's made much worse by a very long war. And um, uh, I decided, say this, that I am to put the, my people of Kingsbridge through that terrible period and see them come out at the other end, not too badly off. Yeah, when you say say this, though, I don't. I, 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 there's so much. Uh... In each of us, I mean, let me, let me test this on you because this is what I learned from Ken Follett novels. I learned great history in a historical context, but great history. You're the uh, Leo Tolstoy of our generation, in my opinion, in terms of the way you capture people and their times. But there's a uh, there's an abraxis. Herman Hesse called it an abraxis when he wrote the book Damien. He said that there's good and evil in in all of us, and so there's contradiction. We try to code over uh, for the people that we're only good, but down deep there's elements of both. And you capture that in these protagonists and these antagonists. And so um, I guess the question I have, sir, is where does this come from? Where does this enlightenment come from? 
where you're able, I feel like when I read your book, it's a, uh, it's a course lesson in psychology for me in human emotion. So where does this come from? Well, I guess like most people, uh, I've learned as time passes and, uh, uh, um, 50, 55 years ago, uh, I would not have been so sensitive to, uh, the fact that, that, uh, most issues are complicated. You know, there's a, you know, there's a scene in never, which I know you've read because you interviewed me about that. There's mm-hmm. a scene in never where, uh, the, the, the president is a woman who has a teenage daughter and they're talking the, the teenage daughter comes up with these, why can't we do so? And so why can't we do? And, um, in the end, she she gets fed up with her mother explaining things to her, explaining why things can't be done. And she says to her mother, why is everything so complicated? And her mother says, because this, because the simple problems get solved straight away. So we're always left with the complicated ones. And I suppose that's something that we all learn, you know, the, 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 the teenage, uh, the teenage protester in never is, is, definitely based on the teenage Follett, who was passionate about things uh, like uh, the Vietnam War. And um, uh, over the years, I've been involved in politics. My wife was a member of parliament for yes. years. And um, and I've realized that the, all the problems we're facing are complicated because we already solved the simple ones. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the uh, when I had my first briefing, you know, I, I had a short stay in the White House, obviously, but I had a I had a briefing and uh, the gentleman that briefed me, he had two lines that I uh, always share with people. Number one, he said to me, Anthony, there are workhorses and there are show horses in our government. And you're going to figure out very quickly who the workhorses are, uh, the ones that are yeah. actually doing the work of the people. It could be our field agents. It could be Ken Follett protagonists and some of your early spy novels that are out there securing nuclear weapons for Israel or defending the uh, Commonwealth against Hitler and he says, you'll always know, there's a, you'll, 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 you'll discern quickly who the workhorse is, who the show horse is. He said, the other problem is if it comes to your desk and it's on the way to the president, that means there were 5,000 other people in the American government that couldn't make the decision. And now it's going to be this very troublesome decision, you know? Yeah, I and, get it. I get it. I but get you, it. But you, you, you're at the shop end there. Yeah, exactly. And you you capture a lot of this stuff. So, so let's go to some of the... Uh, struggles of our time and the struggles of the time in the armor of light uh trade unions we have uh, the united auto workers are striking although it looks like they may have settled now with ford people's rights in terms of discrimination or the right to work all these things that are out there the cost of living crisis you just mentioned it about the book and bread prices but we're also experiencing that for the common men and women in both of our countries the uk and the united states cost of living has really gone up. Feel, people feel the disposable income they have has shrunken. Even if yeah. the economy feels strong from the data, it feels tight from the middle class. Um, are these problems intractable, sir? You writing about these problems from 200 years ago. Are they intractable? We seem like we have the same problems today. Uh, well, I think that, uh, I think these, I think problems are often solved very slowly uh and looking back on the historical novels that i've written it's it's quite common for the people in the story to be struggling for some kind of freedom and it's often a freedom that we take for granted today uh and i found found it interesting to tell a story about a time when you couldn't take that for granted and most people thought it was foolish for example the 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 uh, the the right to religious freedom, which I wrote about in a column mm-hmm. of fire, and uh, uh, at the at the time it was shocking and horrifying that some people did not adhere to the established religion, and um, people killed one another over it. And now, if you think of, you probably don't know whether your next door neighbour is Protestant or Catholic or neither, right. and uh, yeah. and and you don't care, and nobody cares. We won that, or you know, our ancestors, right. our forebears, won that battle. But boy, it took hundreds of years. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that's frustrating about politics, 
is that is that change takes so long and often costs so many lives well it's very it's very well said i i i and you and you tell this through your characters and again i don't want to give up the book to people i just want to encourage them all to to read it you're just this wonderful storyteller um but there's one woman in the book my wife will probably be jealous of me even talking about this one woman but uh are uh, you have a crush on this woman arabella that you write about sir well yes uh she's she's kind of gorgeous and um she's not a teenager and uh or actually all my life i've had a weakness for well when i was young it was a weakness for older girls and then later it was a weakness for older women and uh she's an older woman she's much older than the guy she falls for who's called spade and uh the other thing that i liked about their relationship is that she is a sexy woman who has spent 30 years married to a guy who's not that interested in her and so there's there's terrific terrific under her surface there's there's a terrific there's a volcano and uh it just wants a guy to come along who can understand that and who can understand her and treat her with respect uh and um uh the love affair becomes very very passionate I, I think we've talked about this before, but I got to mention it again for some of my new viewers and listeners. Uh, you, you remember the legendary novelist uh, Herman Wook? Yes. Yeah, and uh, and uh, he he had that way with characters too. I mean, you are uh, when I read your characters, I'm living with them. I can feel their personalities. I I can't see their facial expressions, but you write about their facial expressions in a way that I've overseen them, meaning I don't need to see their faces. I can feel the essence of their soul coming onto the page. Um, and uh, for those of us who are the Salieri's of writing, okay, where you are the Mozart, uh, for those of us that are the Salieri's of writing, where does that come from? Is this something that you feel you were born with? Clearly you've refined it over the years, uh, but where does it come from, this gift that you have? Oh. I think all of us who write novels are born with um, uh, extraordinary imagination. And I, you know, I think all the right writers I've ever talked to about this have felt the same. Uh, when I was a boy, I was never playing myself. I was always pretending to be a cowboy or a pirate or the captain of a spaceship. And that imagination, people say, where do you, you know, how do you get your ideas? I suppose I, I sometimes say, how do I stop? because it just never stops. And I think we're all like that. So you have, and I suspect you're born with it. And I, and so you have to have that. And then you have to spend a lot of the first 20 or 30 years of your life reading, because that's how we learn about mm -hmm. how to tell, how to tell a story, mm -hmm. uh, how we learn, you know, we learn about chapters. We learn about cliffhangers, um, describing a landscape, we learn how to do dialogue in such a way that it doesn't it's it's fast and it's interesting and it's never boring we learn all that but then so we get to our 20s or 30s or 40s and start to try and write a novel we already have 90% of what we need but there's more that you need and mm -hmm. actually um getting something that i had to learn because i hadn't figured it out from what i'd read was the way that you have to get the reader to share the emotions of the characters so no that question. when a character is scared, the reader, reader sits on the edge of her chair. And uh, when, something when something sad happens, the reader has a tear in the eye. Uh, and when, something, when somebody is bullied or treated in some way unjustly, the reader says, this is not right. This has got to stop. And uh, that's what holds the reader to the story. The reader starts to care about these people as if they were real people. And, um, uh, and I think all, all successful, successful popular novelists do this. For me, it was something I had to focus on. It's, as you know, I wrote uh, 10 unsuccessful books before I had a hit. 
And one of the things I was learning during that period was how to how to get you and how to get all the readers to feel the emotions of the people mm-hmm. in the story. But there's a brand that you have. I mean, honestly, when I see that your uh, your book is in queue, it's coming back uh, to the bookstores. I'm like, all right, I got to have a fantastic few weeks here of reading this book. You mentioned never. And so after our last interview, um, I sent that book out. Uh, You know, we have like this Trump recovery program, you know, like Alcoholics Anonymous. It would include people like Mark Esper and Bill Barr. And now General Milley's part of that uh, program. And I sent your book out to all of these guys that I work with in the administration because uh, and, uh, you know, because it's reminiscent of uh, the Sinclair Lewis book, which I'm sure you either had to have read or you 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 built some of it in there. You know, the the book titled "It It Can't Happen Here." You know, I right. think it's 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 you know because you're saying never, it can't happen. But yet you're writing a story that actually could happen, and we're watching yeah. Yeah. In, in current events some a manifestation of some of the things that are happening right here, right now, as we're speaking that were actually foretold in never. And so the question I have is as you think of your historical writing, and that was a contemporary piece, there is a current of history. And the question sometimes is the current can get adjusted or moved depending on leadership. I think we we understand that we had Roosevelt in this country, that you had Churchill in your country, uh, and they were lovers of the institutions of democracy, a result of which they didn't fall prey to the sinister nature of totalitarianism. And so my question after reading this book I want to get to Napoleon in a second, but reading this book, what is your theory on that? The great man or the great woman in history, can they change the course of history or they can, can they protect a society? I think it's such an interesting question. What is, what is leadership? What is it that enables those people to get everybody on their side? You know, it wasn't just that Roosevelt had those ideas about how to fire up the uh, American economy and how to take care of people who were suffering. It wasn't just that he had the ideas. He had the power to explain them to people in a way that made people say, yes, yes, geez, that's right, isn't it? We really got to do this. And I think that's the, that's the great. And, and of course, it can be those talents can also be used neg- negatively. Yes, of course. Well, yeah, they, yeah, get, people they, they can are, be turned to the sinister. It can be a sinister edge of the meal. Yeah. You have people who can say dumb things, you know, lock Hillary Clinton up, and a and crowd goes, yeah, yeah. And uh, so it can be an evil uh, talent as well as a good one, but it's certainly the core of it is, is that ability to make people go along with what you're saying. When you... I mean, again, I don't want to ruin the book, but there's an amazing scene in this book, um, the Battle of Waterloo, which we've all read about uh, in European history. I've had the opportunity on the 200th anniversary of that battle to visit the area of Waterloo. Of course, we know the the great protagonists like the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon. Uh, You tell such a great story. Um, And I guess the question I have for you is how do you recreate that scene? I, I've seen Sarah do it actually at Gettysburg. You know, he wrote a great book about that, uh, uh, Michael Sarah. How'd you do it? How do you, like, where, where, where are you getting, are you, is this a manifestation of your reading? Did you go visit the site? Uh, did you talk with other historians? How did you piece that together from a forensic perspective? Uh, all of those things. I started off by reading books and, and, uh, there must be uh, a thousand books um, that have been written about the Battle of Waterloo, but uh, but the books and the maps tell you a lot. But it was important to me to go there. I spent a week on the battlefield mm-hmm. uh, with a friend of mine who is a retired general in the British Army and whose hobby is Waterloo. Right. And so he mm-hmm. walked me around. We went. We went everywhere, uh, and he explained explained it to. And actually, being there of course, enabled me to visualize much more clearly exactly how everything went along. And it's, it's, I know that when you're in the heart of a battle, often things are very confusing. And uh, to some of the people in the battle, 
uh, the, some of them don't have any idea what's going on. But that's not the way to write it. I mean, you can say that things are confusing, but the reader mustn't be confused. The reader must know exactly what's happening in this yeah. battle. That's, yeah. where, that's where the tension comes from and the, and the satisfaction. So, so getting all the facts straight and then, of course, you know, not overdoing it with the facts, but but describing the course of the battle and what the issues are and what the tensions are, clearly that's important. And then doing that, you also have to tell the story through the eyes of the people who are there and who are looking at this and trying to figure out what to do and, and who are scared uh, or maybe they're terrifically brave uh, maybe they're eager to get at the enemy and maybe they're thinking about running away uh, and they probably can't run away because they'd be caught. So it's if, you, if, you've, if you've got the battle clear in your head, you can make it clear in the reader's head and then you can tell the story of that battle in terms of the feelings and experiences of characters uh, who are there. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing it they're at the ground level and they're seeing it like that. And I think if you could put all of those things together, a battle can be really fascinating. I, I don't, th I don't, I'm careful not to overdo it. There's often one big battle in one of my novels, but I, I don't overdo it. I don't think my, my readers love history often, but, um, they don't want an awful lot of military history. Uh, they want, a, they want a fairly, basic story that engages them and explains to them why the battle was won and why the mm -hmm. battle was lost. Well, the, I, I'm going to say something to you and I want you to react to it if you don't mind. So I read sure. the book, I get to the battle scene again, don't want to ruin things, but I just say that the, I, I always come away with a revelation from one of your books. If you named a title of your book, I could say this was my revelation, you know, as an example, triple, I didn't understand the full dynamic of how important it was. I mean, I was a young kid when I read Triple about how important it was to get the nuclear device and uh, and the whole thing that was behind the Mossad and 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 the way you described it. Uh, on Wings of Eagles, um, the entrepreneurial character of Ross Perot that goes on to become a presidential candidate. And by the way, your protagonist, who is a real life person upsets the American political system. I'll explain this to you. My opinion is he so threatens the duopoly that they strengthen the duopoly. It's almost impossible as a result of Ross Perot to mount a third party challenge to the duopoly because of all the legal moats and so forth that they put up. But anybody that read On Wings of Eagles would be like, okay, I get this. This SOP is crazy. He's ready to throw the Molotov cocktail. Um, Pillars of Earth, you're getting a sense for the the way people thought of the church at a time where we didn't have science like we do today. I think some of our agnosticism about our neighbors is related to the advances of science, frankly, because we were all clinging to this religious faith, and therefore my my faith had to be better than your faith, so let me hit you in the head with a rock if you don't have my faith. But now that we're looking at all the science, we've become more indifferent to each other's face. I got got that out of your books. But in this book, the battle scene, I'm going to test this on you. I'm like, okay, this is actually the first industrial revolution battle. They're massacring each other. They're using weaponry that is way more advanced than the Revolutionary War, even you know, 30 years prior, or 25 years prior. And obviously you write about this in, you know, the World War One and Obviously, World War II was the great devastation with the bomb. But I guess my point is, is that that the technology is moving faster than our morality, isn't it, Mr. Follett? Oh, always, always, I think. Uh, and um, uh, and then then there are there are new forms of weapons, and there are arguments, and um, and people say these weapons have been invented and they must never be used. And there's a discussion about that, but it's a futile discussion because if those weapons exist, then they're, then they're going to be used. So, so yes, and we struggle. I mean, we've been arguing 
uh, certainly all my life, people have been arguing about the morality of, of having nu nuclear weapons at all. And there's always been, in, in the UK anyway, there's always been a substantial minority of people who, who said we, we shouldn't even have these. We should mm -hmm. destroy them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and look at all the happy uh, and, and prosperous countries that don't even have nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. and they're closer to the, to the Soviet Union than we are. So I think you're right. You, you, get, a, you get a moral argument about new weapons, but um, the moral argument never actually stops anybody using them. Uh, and, of course, we've... Um, well, let, listen, let's hope this is the first time, you know, because they've been used once, nuclear weapons have been used once, and let's hope that this time the moral argument wins and they're never used again. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but boy, it's a scary it's a scary. It's scary. Well, you write about, obviously you write that, about that in the book, never, but, but I, uh, I, uh, I want to, I want to ask you, I get to this section of my interviews with my authors and my producer and I, we come up with uh, five words. I'm going to say the word, and then I want you to give me your reaction to it. It could be a paragraph. It could be a word. Just your stream of consciousness. Uh, and, uh, when, and, and in reading the book, the first word that comes to mind is character. What's your reaction to the word character? Uh, it's, it, it's, the, it's the first thing and the last thing. Uh, that's what we're interested in. Um, in both senses of the word, the characters and their personalities, two senses of the word character. And it's at the heart of everything. And if you don't get that right, you're finished. Yeah, and I think that's a central element of your storytelling, the definition of these characters, both the protagonist and the antagonist. I think this is ultimately your genius. I'm going to say the word history. What do you think of when I say the word history? Uh, well, um, I think that of all that I've learned, you know, I hated history at school. I was bored by it. And uh, in, my, in my working career, I've become absolutely fascinated by it. And it's, as you know, it's part of my life and it's very much part of my work. So, um, uh, and the great thing about it is, <clears throat> although there aren't always, it doesn't always repeat itself, and you can't always talk about lessons to be learned because that's too simple. But I think what you get by reading history is a is just a broader and more accepting view of the present day. Mm -hmm. Because you think, although this hasn't happened before, things like this have happened before, and you've studied the conflicts that mm -hmm. there have been in the past, and you, instead of saying, oh, my God, this is terrible, well, you may say this is terrible, but you also know that it's not new. Well, it's it's so fascinating because you know the uh, a, a recent book it was written a few years ago. Uh, Governor Christie gave it to me, uh, and uh, it's called "The Accidental President," and it's about Harry Truman. And oh. the the book is really about what happened to him. He wasn't educated, you know. He never went to college, but he fought in the First World War. He had the benefit of the effect on his character or the effect on his character of failure. He had a haberdashery that went out of business. This is Lincoln-esque in terms of like having these uh, self-conscious uh, failures that you have to get through, uh, which teaches him resilience. And now he is inheriting the job from somebody who was a larger than life figure. And frankly, for a lot of American adults was the only president that they knew. And the only voice they recognize as, pre as president, and there's a scene in this book where uh, he calls one of the cabinet officials and he says, uh, you know, the, you know, I want you to do blah, blah, blah. And he says, you, he says, well, the president, he says, the quote is, the president wants you to do blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, when did the president ask this? And he says, uh, right now, meaning because he's thinking of Roosevelt. So this is the smaller stature. Ha, you know, and and he's one of your characters. You, he shows up in your books. This man of commonality, this common man who has good character, but also understands history. He's thrust into the historical moment. But Truman was a great reader, and uh, and so this is my uh, my third thing that I want to ask you: the word underdog. <laughs> Well, you know, it makes me think of our king, who 
people still refer to as Prince Charles. Right, exactly. Well, of course, yes, yeah, 70 and, plus years as Prince Charles, yep. And uh, when you, if you say the Queen, they think you're talking about Queen Elizabeth II. And uh, it just... Um, uh, and it must be so infuriating for King Charles that people still still think his mother is the Queen, even though um, she's been dead for some time now. And uh, But I think the underdog is a very interesting character. And if we're talking about, you know, the, the basic plot of a book like The Armour of Light, it's really about, the, about how the underdogs fight a battle. Uh, what we have is working people fighting for freedom of speech and the right to form a union. And, uh, 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 and the odds are against them because the powerful people don't want to give in to them and powerful people, by definition, usually get their way. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so, uh, so what's happening in the armor of light is a fight of the weak against the strong. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that makes it a great story, especially if the weak win. You see, it's fascinating what you said, though, because even with royal blood, you can see yourself or be perceived as an underdog. You know, I mean, ultimately, the reason why we all love underdogs is that we all see ourselves as underdogs. Do you, do you, know, do you know what I mean? It's very funny. Um, OK, two last words. and I'm going to let you go, sir. Thank you for all this time. That you're giving me what a privilege. Storytelling. I say the word storytelling. You say what? Uh, oh, I use that word a lot. I I, I talk about a, a lot of the time. I talk don't talk about my books. I talk about my stories. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what I've got. You know, I feel a bit like a bit like uh, you know. There was a time when Bob Dylan lost all his money for some reason, and he said, "All I've got is these songs." <laughs> uh, needless to say, that was enough. And um, you know, that's that's why I've spent my life the way I have. Like, I have spent it. It's because I have these stories in my head and I'm able to share them with people. So storytelling is absolutely at the core of my life. Okay. So the last word is a fusion of two, actually. It's, so it's, uh, it's Ken Follett. And I say Amos. You may say Amos. Uh, but there's a character in this book. And I've heard it because I, I listened to your interviews and you, you, you said that there's a little bit of Amos in you or you and Amos. And so tell me about Ken Follett and tell me why you said that about this character in the book. Okay. Well, um, he is, he's a young man at the beginning of the story and he is, he's something of an innocent, uh, you know, he doesn't really know that there are people in this world who are sly and conniving and will cheat you if they possibly can. He kind of thinks most people are, are reasonable and decent and um, and the the story begins with him having a huge problem. He inherits his father's business uh, uh, when his father dies, and he's he has felt for a long time he's ready to run this business, and now he discovers that he's not as smart as he thought he was. Now I I um you know that's an experience I've had more than once, realizing I'm not as smart as I thought I was, and it's probably not just me; it's probably everybody. Well, it's definitely me, sir. I can tell you my my failure. You don't have enough time in the day for me to tell you my shortcomings. Okay, well, uh, and and then he gets Amos gets through this crisis at, near the beginning of the story. He has other crises, but he, this one he gets through, um, and he and he basically. Uh, succeeds because he's a real worker and there's a little there's a little bit of me in that you know I'm a perfectionist I rewrite a lot I listen to my readers I listen to my editors uh, and if you know if a chapter needs to be rewritten uh, uh, I I it's natural to feel oh my god I've already written that why am I going to do it again but you just have to say, if it needs doing, it needs doing, and I've got to do it. So, so Amos's approach that if he is honest and works hard, he'll come through. Uh, I I think that has been part of my success of, has been that feeling. If I really work hard at this, I can probably do it. What? Yeah, you know, and again, you don't have to be specific if it's uh, confidential. What What are you thinking about next? Oh, well, you know, I'd love to tell you, but I can't. Can't, and right, I, right. I, okay, I figured that. I figured as much. Um, well, you, as you, I, but, I'm sure you. But know the good the news is, you are. The good news is for all of us, you're working oh, yeah. on something again. 
Yes, indeed. Well, I delivered the Armour of Light last Christmas, and since then I've been writing a new story. Okay, uh, great. And it's uh, you know because I don't like to, I don't, I don't want to stop. I don't take three months off. People say to me, "I suppose you take a year off when you finish a book." I, I might take a week off, but uh, yeah, don't this, don't take any time work, off, Mister no. Follett. You know, you got to <laughs> stay active. You know, don't worry. Don't don't worry. You know, it's so interesting. It absorbs me so much that um, I have difficulty stopping. I don't have difficulty doing it. I have difficulty stopping and doing something else. Well, it's always such a pleasure for me to talk to you. I'm grateful for your time. The uh, The title of the book is The Armor of Light, but it's just a fascinating story about the Industrial Revolution, the advent of the D Industrial Revolution, and the conflicts in Europe. Uh, and it's just also very contemporary. When I read your stories... It's connect. It, it's part of the past, but it's connected to the present, and it makes it uh, so relevant to uh, today's viewers and listeners. And uh, I hope you'll come on again when this next book comes out. I'll have I've got you bookmarked, uh, so on Google. So when this next book comes out, my my team's going to reach out to you, sir. That'll be great. I, I'll appreciate that, and I always enjoy talking to you. Thank you. Oh, the same here.